This is a third year for us to do this wire event. And when we thought about this four years ago, I thought, hey, we need to figure out ways to take university professors with all the research that they're doing and figure out how to match that, make value to the community and translate that and have a dialogue. And so one of the words we used was exchange. Now, I purposely wanted the exchange part of this. And I want you to, you're going to participate today. The idea of this exchange is, although professors are doing research, they're thinking about things that are of value uh, to their research side, but there's also value to the community. And the exchange part is, they need you the, for the feedback loop of what they're researching. You're going to give them valuable information. And for the last two years, we found that to be true. Both, all the people that have presented in the past, came away from the dialogue thinking about what the community said or the interactions with the businesses and were guiding some of the research that they were doing. So not only is an exchange that way, but we found on campus two people researching almost the same topic. And so hopefully we'll have exchanges for professors across the campus. So this is going to be an interactive dialogue. So I want you to prepare ahead of time as people are talking. Think about questions. Think about how this re re relates to not only your business, your community, or maybe just as a higher level thought that you want to kind of get across or understand that might be useful in, in the, this dialogue. Now, one thing that comes with this, usually we do the Economic Outlook Conference, and most of you are familiar with that. Uh, I already know exactly what the person's going to say. I know the outcome of where we're going. I've planned every detail. In this one, we've done a lot of planning, but I purposely want this to be kind of messy. I want you to, to kind of be the counter-argument, think about things, and, and interpret. And I don't know what the final conclusion this is. This is kind of like my five-year-old daughter. I played Lincoln Logs with her. Everyone knows what Lincoln Logs are, right? So when I sat down with Lincoln Logs, I looked at the instructions. I put the sides on. I put the top on. It was clean. It was done. And when my five-year-old daughter started doing this, she put some Lincoln Logs on, and she looked over, and she found some Weeble Wobbles and put them in the center. And then she looked over and found some checkers and kind of touched it and figured it out. And she didn't go by it, but she created a really unique and, and useful tool herself that was beautiful, but she didn't have to follow all the instructions. And that's kind of how we're going to have it today. It's going to be a little bit messy, but we will come up with something a little bit better. We'll see how they, how they interact with each other. So the creative class. Now I've been out talking to businesses for quite a few years, talking about different issues, and one of the things that I hear quite often is this retention and attraction of key skill labor. and when you push back and try to understand who are those within this key skilled labor, and we start talking about this, there's a concern amongst which all about, about being able to retain them and attract them. And then when you start pushing back, I'm not so sure the community really understands what, what that really means to retain and attract some key skilled labor. And I'm not sure we also know the nuances and difficulties of doing that as a community or as a business. So I think when, when we presented this topic of the creative class, I think this is actually quite relevant to Wichita. And I'm not so sure that everything will be just simple and easy to think about this creative class. And so I think as you dialogue with this, push back a little bit. Think about how does this really work? One of the things that I found fascinating and one of the many presentations I did we talked about skilled labor, and I presented these different types of skills by purses and was trying to interact with the HR group. And one day they said, oh, yes, we've got skilled labor. They're really good. And, and, really, and we can look, and if you can look on our website. We've measured skills and knowledge categories on our website, and we have good labor. However, our ability to attract and retain the very high skill, the super creative, they might come, but they kind of slip out of our community. And I found that interesting when I had that dialogue. And it wasn't just engineers. It was architects. It was everything. It was multi-sectors, where they don't quite stick around very long in this community. But we still have good labor, just not the really top knowledge, the super creative people. So um, I share that as to, to think about that. Is that a, a true statement for your company? Is that a true statement for Wichita? And, and disagree all you want with that because I think that will help us to get a bigger picture of what's, what we're going to talk about. 
I want to say a, a thank you to our media sponsor, KMUW. They're also a great partner with the university. We, we love KMUW. They uh, did a lot of advertisements for us for this event, so, so thank you, KMUW, for, for your support. <laughs> our promoting partners here, we have several of you in the audience, and you guys have a lot of the key relationships in the community. And not only you have key relationships in the community, I see these these partners here really taking this information and thinking about this. So we're going to talk about it today, but how does this apply to for entrepreneurship? How does this apply to workforce and, and so forth, the young professionals? So I see these groups also carrying this information out and taking it out to a broader audience to, to Wichita um, or in the state. Uh, so another one I want to, uh, to bring attention to is WSU TV. They do a lot for the center. They are a, they're really one of the backbones to what we do when we produce content, and they're a useful tool for delivering content to this community. So they're recording today. Oops, I was supposed to take this off. They're recording, uh, they're recording this event today, and they're going to replay it back on their media channels. And this is a great way to say, hey, we have a dialogue here, but let's have this dialogue. Let's spill this knowledge over. It's a transfer of this information and conversation to a broader community. And so, although the videos won't be up today, they'll be, it'll take a little while from the edit and put it up and put it on their media channels. When they do, grab it, share it with other people. Keep the dialogue going about this. And although we can do that in the future, for this morning, there's people that you might know that are representative of the creative class, or people or communities or businesses that might want to be embracing it. And to do that, let's have a dialogue. Use our hashtag. Uh, KS Econ, and bring people in, tag them, take pictures. And if you want to not be too far to take a picture of the front screen, you can go to our website, and the presentations are on there, and you can take a picture of uh, the presentations, the slides, and, and share them freely. I want this information to go out and have a dialogue about it. So, Okay, so here's the structure of what we're going to do today. This first half, I have two professors. They're going to give a broader perspective. Let me go back to this Lincoln log kind of analogy, right? So we have those logs. This is maybe our city. And we have these weeble wobbles. They're going to measure. They're going to think about how, many, how big our Lincoln log house is. They're going to talk and describe the, the weeble wobbles. They're going to think about it as an attraction strategies, things like that. They're going to be very analytical and thinking about this, giving us a framework to think about the creative class, which is going to be useful to kind of kind of set the stage and hang the bigger, deeper knowledge to it. The second half that we're going to do for this morning is going to get more in the nuance of what does it really mean to, to work with the creative class or to attract the creative class? What is the community doing about this? And how does that really relate to you and I on a daily basis? So if you'll see the longer vision, this first part is setting it up. The second part is going to really get deeper into the the practitioner knowledge and actions of how to execute something like that. Uh, so I'm going to introduce both speakers. They're going to come up one at a time. And then we're going to go into a panel discussion with them. And so as you have, there's lots of paper and pens, write down questions. I want to engage with you to think about some of these ideas. So let me go to introduce them. The first one is going to be Dr. Timothy Kraft. Uh, he is an uh, associate professor of finance, and he's also the director of the Koch Global Trading Center. Uh, he teaches uh, corporate finance and investments, and he's going to talk about some of his equations on, on the creative class and attracting for, for the Wichita economy and set a little bit of that stage. And then uh, Dr. Sai Srithrong Rong is an pr associate professor of... of um, uh, Public administration, thank you. And she teaches uh, public uh, finance, and she also teaches local and state economic development. So there's some practicability of how to think about growing economy that she can bring into it. And she's going to dig into one segment, which is going to be more on the arts and the culture side of this creative class, which I think is going to be a useful thing for how we fit in. Uh, how, what is that creative class on, on, on the art side, and how are we growing it, and, and what's the value behind those two things? So before we do that, I'm going to show you a quick video that uh, James the, from our staff took some video of our community, of businesses, 
in the creative class and thinking about it. So this will give you some of the definition and words this morning. Good morning. Glad to see everyone here this morning after a very rainy evening. But just said my name. <clears throat> excuse me. Just said as Jeremy said before, my name is Tim Kraft, and I'm a professor over in the business school at Wichita State University. And as many of our city council members and the mayor are probably happy to know, I'm also a resident of the city of Wichita for the last 17 years. So obviously, my interest in this topic is more than just academic. <laughs> so to give you an overview or idea. So what I'll be talking about today, just that obviously we're talking about the creative class. What I want to talk about in my presentation is give you sort of an overview of thinking about how cities actually grow. As you can probably guess, there isn't just one way this happens. Regional growth is very, you know, multifaceted. And thinking about this, and as we'll see when we go through my presentation, and I'm sure the other presentations today, is that you'll see that's really a more interdisciplinary and a very, it's going to have to be a very collaborative effort in thinking about all the different sort of parts that are moving together to bring economic development, obviously, to our region. So to give you an idea about my agenda today, as I said, I wanted to sort of begin, and don't worry, as Jeremy said, I would be talking about equations. There'll be no equations in my presentation. <laughs> Just, but I want to give you a sense of, sort of in a traditional sense, how people think cities or regions grow. Then obviously talk about the creative class. Then talk a little bit about something called, it's from Rust Belt to Brain Belt. Now, I'll be honest, I did not coin that term, but we'll talk a little bit about that later. And the last thing is what the implications would be for Wichita. And I guess I should be careful. When I'm saying Wichita, a lot of times I'm not talking about really just the city itself, but our economic region. I could be very specific and say I'm talking about our metropolitan statistical area. But in a census, or how the US Census sort of defines that is basically, you know, Imagine there's a core you know, city and then all the areas around it that rely on it for, you know, there's a lot of economic connection with the surrounding areas. So for the city of Wichita, really the MSA is really the city and obviously Sedgwick County and then the surrounding counties. But to give you an idea of the economic strength of the, or the, talking about the region as a whole and how it might grow. And so the first thing is, and obviously a lot of policymakers like to know this is, so sort of how do cities grow? You know, how does, how does a region grow? And by this, I'm really talking more about economically instead of just number of people in the area. And so it's kind of a chicken and egg story. So of course, which comes first? You know, do people follow firms? 
So from a regional perspective, should we worry about firms moving to our area? And then obviously people will follow them looking for jobs. Or is the other way of now thinking about it is that it's really looking at how are firms following people? So if I'm a firm and I'm looking for, you know, I need to look in an area, what's the skilled labor force? And as we'll get to into obviously more specifics in a few minutes, how is the, you know, the people and the labor, or the skills in the labor force, are the people deciding where to locate first and then business have to follow them? Or does it go back to, you know, looking for firms to locate in your area first that would bring people? And the quick answer is, just like the chicken and egg story is, really both things are going on. So I wanted to begin with, and this is where I'll get more, I guess, theoretical or give you a background, but as, as I said, no equations. And as I said, typical sort of economic development is really focused on what I'm referring to just as the physical capital of an area. And it's these physical attributes that obviously generate, that attract people and firms to the area and obviously that's what leads to economic growth. So what are these? So obviously in the original, you know, why did cities grow? Because they had access to transportation networks, access to natural resources, access to a workforce. So obviously if I'm a firm and I'm looking at an area, obviously I need to know that the people are there. But as I said, in this sort of more older model, it's really the idea that, well, if we build it, they will come. So if I build my giant factory or steel mill, labor will sort of just show up because that's where the jobs are. And then access to public amenities. So if I'm thinking, if I'm at the firm level thinking about this, I'm looking at not just the area as a whole and if there's a workforce, but then once I get to that area, what sort of amenities can I be looking for? And by this, I mean the firm looking for. So I see these are, I know it seems very boring, but to some people in this room, they'll realize that these are not free things. So you worry about water and sewer systems education systems, the tax policies of the area, the regulations of the area, and so forth. And I said at most of this, and notice that focus is basically all on the firm. And it's about lowering their cost or making them more efficient. And not very much of the focus is on individual workers. Because obviously most, of, they're thinking, in these sort of older models, it's thinking about the firms are generating the economic growth. And you're looking for how can we get the basically inputs together that will attract these firms to our area and make them grow. So to give you an example, take an example like the city of Pittsburgh. There we go. Obviously an old photo I found online, but it works. You know, how did the city of Pittsburgh grow? Why was it, you know, it was established? Because obviously it was, had river networks, at the beginning of rail networks to the city. Obviously access to iron ore, coal, water, all the things you need to build or to make steel. But also access to a growing number of immigrants. This is more in the end of the 19th century, thinking that you had large immigration to the east coast of the United States. So obviously pulling them in farther to Pittsburgh. And then the other thing that happens is once some steel firms sort of move to the area, it sort of attracts other firms. And so you get these benefits of what are called agglomeration. And what's agglomeration? It's just the idea that at an industry level, you have lots of different, you know, big or different players in this industry moving to the area. Because of that, then it increases the number of specialized suppliers and subcontractors. Obviously, you're going to tend to then have a more specialized workforce in that area or in that industry. And then the other part, and this is actually very important, the idea that you have more communication within the industry. So a lot of times we think of different firms. So if I'm a steel firm and you're a steel firm, we're in the same business and we're competitors, which is true. But what can also happen is, imagine in this industry, as you have more, you know, it's a, the agglomeration of different players, that you have better communication. And that when new ideas come up, that they percolate throughout the system. So it isn't just that I came up with a new idea and I'm gonna hide it, which can happen, and the issue we'll get to later, but. The idea that in general that things come up and because it kind of moves, imagine you have different people might move from one company to another company and bringing the different, you know, the exchange of ideas and so forth. And so that's in a very classic sense, that's what agglomeration is. So obviously Silicon Valley is an example of this, obviously with high tech, you know, obviously Pittsburgh with steel making. An example I'll talk about later with Akron was actually in tire manufacturing. And I see an easy example, obviously, in our own city of Wichita. Obviously, in the aviation industry, you have the big players, obviously, 
But then there are new, for the big players, I think people forget that there are numerous small you know, subcontractors, suppliers, and so forth working in these networks. And obviously, it's the combination of all of this together that leads to economic growth. Oh, it's thinking about it. All right, let's see if we can go. Thank you. There we go. So, as I said, so those were what I was talking about, more the physical capital. It was mostly mainly theories looking at what would make the firm move to an area and what would be these sort of physical qualities of the area. Imagine what's happened sort of more than the later, you know, 20th century is a focus on human capital. So the idea of you know, what is the individual skill level? Thinking about what's happened at the, oh, I'm sorry, did we miss the slide? There we go. I was gonna say, thinking about in the original agglomeration and sort of physical capital, also then thinking about sort of what's hurt certain cities in the, you know, in the second half of the 20th century. And so these bigger ideas happening, obviously are called deindustrialization, obviously a great increase in global competition, rise in new technologies, and changes in the nature of work and the skills required to do it. And so because of that, imagine academic research, you then have sort of a shift to thinking of things in terms of human capital. So what can make an area, so these are actually thinking about, you know, still items that will make, or ideas that will help an economy grow or region grow. So you're looking at the individual skill level and a lot of times this is measured by educational attainment. So a shortcut way, imagine for a lot of academic research, you had the big ideas, I'm gonna look at something, but then obviously I need some way of measuring it. So basically I'm taking the big ideas and I need to put some numbers and data to it. So individual skills, you know, what's the skill level of each individual person? You know, it's kind of hard to measure. So one sort of quicker way of measuring it is thinking of college, at, you know, what your educational attainment is, so how many years of education you have, and a lot of times they look at this in terms of the percentage of the population with a college degree, sort of a shortcut way for looking at this. And as you might imagine, you know, many studies show there's a positive correlation between the percentage of the workforce with a college degree and the economic growth of the region. A lot of this, though, as I said, it's more in the later half of the 20th century and obviously going into the 21st century, thinking about it in terms of what's sometimes called the knowledge economy, or sometimes called the post-industrial economy. But the real focus here is on human capital being a competitive advantage for the firm. It's very different, if I'm thinking of the giant steel mill, obviously there were engineers and so forth who had to think about how are we going to structure this, how do we make steel? But a lot of the workforce then was mainly in the production of the steel itself. And even though it requires some skills, for a lot of it, you are, you know, the labor is somewhat interchangeable. For this, in the more post-industrial economy, it's thinking about, for a lot of firms, their main source of competitive advantage is the human capital, so basically the people working for them. So to give you an example, obviously, like in a software company, I don't necessarily need a giant factory to build software. What I need, basically, are programmers, the, you know, the people with the skills to do that. And so thinking about how that you know, its software company is going to grow, then it's mainly from its human capital. Same, obviously, in the biomed technology. If you're thinking of, you know, pharmaceuticals, you know, obviously I still need laboratories and so forth, but most of the, you know, real growth of the company is coming from this human capital. And that's what's giving them a competitive, you know, their competitive, competitive advantage. So to bring this in, so I said, so the human capital, this is not some new theory. This has existed for several decades. What's new about it, so we're talking about the creative class. And so this was an idea, it's popularized by a man called Richard Florida, which sometimes becomes a little confusing because Florida is not, you know, mainly people know Florida as a state. It's not a very common last name, but this is his name, and obviously, you know, he's a real person, so. He created a book, or I'm sorry, he wrote a book in 2002 called The Rise of the Creative Class. And actually he worked as, it's kind of interesting, and so a little different for me, he works as a professor. And so he's working as a professor before this, and writes a book, it's just uncommon for professors to write books that become popular 
in the general public. <laughs> That's just, and it's great, well, and also, I mean, part of it is it's great that he could take, I mean, as you can see, what he's writing about comes from, he didn't just all of a sudden one day wake up and think of this. You know, it comes out of thinking about, you know, this human capital and so forth, and sort of building on that, and he comes up with, so he writes a book about it that's actually accessible. It does not have any equations in it. It has some graphs and so forth, but, you know, the idea, though, came about from thinking about, you know, this human capital and thinking about how it leads to economic growth. And so his focus is mainly, it's kind of, think of creative class as being sort of a fusion between what I was calling this physical capital and human capital. Sort of bringing these ideas together. And he talks about in terms of what he calls the three T's. So imagine, even as a professor, you have to come up with sort of a cute name for thinking about this. So his three T's of economic growth are talent, technology, and tolerance. Because fortunately, they all begin with the letter T, but that's... <laughs> But they're really out in outgrowth of sort of, as I said, the physical capital and the human capital. And the argument he makes is that really all three are necessary for economic growth. That areas that really have just one or two of these are not going to do as well as areas that have all three of these. So to give you an idea, and of course a lot of times when you hear about the creative class, I think people mainly, they're thinking about this first part, the talent part. Because this is where I would say, you know, he's kind of caught on to an idea of sort of explaining what skills are. And so he's thought about it differently. So he's defined the skills as being non-routine occupations that require creative problem solving and or the generation of new forms. <laughs> what this really means, I think it's a little easier to think about well, what sort of occupations might have this. And that's really what he's sort of focusing on. So as I said, human capital for a lot of, mainly focused on educational attainment. Whereas a creative class is sort of thinking about skilled labor or skill, you know, obviously human skills is being more defined by the occupation that you're being, you know, that you're working in. So these are, you know, scientists, engineers, high-tech workers, even architects. There's some architects here in the crowd today, but it's, obviously you're creating new forms. Believe it or not, professors, I'm not just saying this because I'm a professor, but this was, you would list it. These are ideas of people who are doing research, analysts, you know, educators, librarians, that you're taking information and changing it, making it more accessible, creating new, obviously taking these large data sets and finding what are the themes that go through it. But also writers and poets isn't just, these are people who are actors, designers, these are people who are, you know, looking at things from maybe a different perspective, but also they're creating new things. And as you saw in the video, it also talked, the first, I guess, kind of three lines I have here, are what are science referred to as the super creative core, and then obviously there are the creative professionals, so healthcare professionals, business management and finance, and legal professions. But thinking about these are areas where really, and this is sort of the big justification of this, is the idea that you are working in an area where as your work, you're more autonomous and that you're also, that you're, the idea that you're creating something new. That as part of your job, it isn't just that you're doing a routine thing every day, but you're thinking, you're presented with new problems, new challenges, and that you're thinking about different ways or new ideas to solve them. Oops, and so to give you an idea, if you think about it in terms of this, so in the United States, this would be about 30% of the workforce. To give you an idea, back in 1980, this was only 20%. And if you go back to 1900, so well, now 117 years ago, there's only about 10% of the workforce. And obviously then most people, if, at least given this, sort of theory, then basically most of the workforce then is in either service industries or working class industries. So, so one thing, and this is actually a down, and I agree with this. Imagine when people, so when the first, or the creative class kind of first came out and then gained popularity, because the kind of idea, well, isn't everyone creative? You know, we as human beings, so I'm calling these people creative class, and I'm saying that that's about 30% of the US workforce. You know, but we are all human beings, and so it kind of implies, well, the other 70% is kind of giving the implication that they're not creative, and that's not really true. The way he's looking at this, so I will use his real quote, so I will give him, because obviously he has the, dealt with this feedback from, you know, his theory, is that basically all human beings are creative, and really what he's talking about is just that 30% of the workforce, which is about 38 million people, are lucky enough to have an occupation where they are paid for their creative endeavors. 
And that's a kind of a different way of thinking about it. That these are people, so it's not just that you work in this occupation, but the idea of thinking about that the economy as a whole is paying you for your creative ideas, your creative output. So they give you an idea. So if I focus just on the workforce, because obviously there's still the other two parts of technology and tolerance. But you're thinking of just the workforce. So who are the, what are the big areas for this? So you can think about, obviously, the easy examples for big research MSA areas. I see the research triangle. So this is Raleigh-Durham in North Carolina. So this is almost 50% of the workforce is working in this creative class. You also have in Silicon Valley. I see in the Boston area, you know, it's about 42%. This last area is kind of funny because at first people don't think about this, but the Washington DC area. So believe it or not, this is actually a very creative area. I'm not 100% sure how congressmen are counted in this. I don't know if they are. <laughs> but the DC, if you remember, this is the whole area. The DC area, if you look, especially in Northern Virginia, you have a lot of high tech companies located there. If you think about it from just offshoots of the Pentagon and thinking of defense spending and so forth, you have a lot of different companies making a very high, you know, these are very high level of research going on. And so as you said, so I don't know if you go to, obviously right to the Capitol building or so forth right in downtown DC, how those people are counted, but there are a lot of people doing you know, very creative work. Then another example of this is, imagine if you're a small college town, it becomes easy for this because you're a small town and you have a big research institution. So like in Boulder or in Ann Arbor, obviously the University of Michigan, Ithaca, New York, this is the home of Cornell University and Corvallis, Oregon, which is the University of Oregon. You think about these are small you know, college towns, obviously with a big university, but the universities also do spin off other businesses. So there are other firms, so imagine, but they're mainly in a lot of doing with research, ba either basic research or converting that research into you know, economically viable items. And so it's very popular in these small college towns. To give you an idea, in our own region, so I see for the city of Wichita, you see, it's basically just above the national average, about 31%, which is the same as it is in Tulsa. And another in Oklahoma City, it's 33%. You know, sorry, in Kansas City, it's 35%. And so it gives you an idea in our region, actually, you know, in the, our competitor cities, obviously, in the region, it's all, if you think about it in terms of creative class, it's pretty similar. And so it gives you an idea of sort of how Wichita stacks up against other cities. I sometimes caution that science people focus very much on, okay, we're at 31% and we should be at 35%. <laughs> and it's not exactly that. As I said, I want to get into, as I said, in a few minutes, get into, it's really more at work. I mean, it's obviously an input into this, but it's a lot of uh, different things sort of going together. So that's looking just at the workforce. And I said, Florida's, you know, original sort of improvement, well, not improvement, but, you know, building upon the human capital theory is sort of thinking about that's more the occupation, not just your educational attainment, because I could have a college degree and maybe I'm just working for Uber, you know, driving around, why not? Doesn't mean, I mean, that can be creative maybe, but it's the idea of how I'm actually being used in the economy. So the second part of this technology, this is fairly straightforward, thinking about obviously the more technology in the area, and this is really by thinking about the new inventions in the area, the improvements to existing processes. And a lot of times this is measured by the number of new patents in an area. So there's a lot of research that shows an area that's producing a lot of new patents will have higher economic growth than areas with low numbers of new patents. And so obviously this leads to what we call a lot of high-tech jobs. They'll always, the one problem is, what's the definition of a high-tech job? Depends on who you speak to. <laughs> In general, we always think about, well, it's someone working in you know, Silicon Valley at a software company, or someone working at a pharmaceutical company coming up with new drugs, which is true. But it's thinking about, it's these new, it's part of the new economy, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, the smart economy. But typically, at least in the last 30 years, those areas with high levels or high concentrations of high-tech jobs have tended to have higher levels of economic growth. And then the last one, he calls it tolerance, because I think he needed another word that began with the letter T. But what he's really talking about in the broader sense are, what are the barriers to, er barriers to entry in the city? I'm just, and by this, he's not talking about, like for a firm, it's more at the individual level. So how welcoming is a community? And so as we'll hear about later, just after my talk, is part of it, you know, what is the art, how does the artistic community 
add to the vibrancy or economic growth of an area. And so his argument is, he's thinking of looking at areas, not just you know, what's the labor force or skill level of the labor force, and if you have high-tech jobs and so forth, but it's really this last part is, how open is a city to new ideas? And so his way of measuring this is kind of thinking about looking at, well, where are places that you have vibrant artistic communities? They have very diverse communities. And cities where you have large populations or where you know, artists and so forth have located, is a, it, isn't necessarily, it isn't just that the artist is there and so therefore our oh, city's gonna grow. It's seen as a sign that you have these artists in a diverse community, that this is a sign that then this area or this community is a more welcoming place. And so why do you care about that? Well, it's the idea that the cities that are more like this are gonna be more likely to be accepting of new ideas. Therefore, they're better able to incubate new innovations. And it's gonna be able to support more entrepreneurial business, businesses. Thinking about, you know, so it's just being open to new ideas, open to new people. If adding that on top of this is really, that's where you see these areas grow versus the other areas where that's not the case. And so as I said, it really takes all three of these things. And so they give you a couple examples. So one given, so if I'm looking at Baltimore or the St. Louis area, they have technology, they have universities, they're you know, fairly major universities that are located there, but because they're really not able to retain the top talent or attract this top talent. So an idea, well maybe the cities themselves are not as open to new ideas. Then I mean, a city like Miami or New Orleans, very open to new ideas, very diverse communities and so forth, but they really don't have any technology base. And so therefore these areas are not really growing as well. And then of course the big winners of this, and these are obviously the poster children for this idea of the creative class, are areas like Silicon Valley or in Boston, you in the Washington area, but also cities like Austin and Seattle, that they really have all three of these things. So not only do they have a large creative class workforce, and obviously a lot of high tech jobs, but this idea that they're very diverse areas that have low barriers to entry. So these are areas that are more welcoming of new ideas and new people and so forth. And obviously, in at least in the last 30 years or so, these have been the big winners in the economy. Oops. So they give me that. So that's talking about the creative class. Another this sort of offshoot of this, and I'll be honest, Rust is called Rust Belts the Brain Belt. I cannot take credit for this. Someone, <laughs> I wish I'd coined that, but I had not. This actually comes from a book that just came out last year, kind of detailing research. Is a different kind of, as I said, it's kind of similar to the creative class, just sort of spinning it slightly differently. So it's a book by Antoine van Ochtemael. I'm not saying it very correctly, but he's actually a Dutch researcher who actually, to give you an idea, so he's originally from the Netherlands, worked for the World Bank for years, and then created his own. He's actually, he not only did he coin the Rust Belts, the Brain Belts, but in 1981 he coined the term emerging markets. And he actually ran his own investment company that focused obviously on investments in emerging markets. <laughs> done pretty well for himself and then is going. <laughs> but he's always been sort of interested in economic growth. And so he's working at that, this is obviously with his co-author, Fred Bacher. And what they were looking about is thinking of, looking at these areas that are, that had, signed, had economic decline and how they've sort of reinvented themselves. And so the premise of their work is the idea that the era of cheap is over. And now it's the era of smart, you know, smart, that's what really the world, you know, the future is about being smart. So what do they really mean by this? This is really just the idea that smart innovation is sort of taking over from cheap labor as your competitive advantage. So obviously over the last 20 or 30 years, if you think about for basic sort of production, it's basically focused on can I make it cheaper and cheaper? And so a lot of that has to focus on where can I get cheaper and cheaper labor? Now they actually see sort of things reversing. And that's actually why he had sort of his original interest in this. Obviously, he was focused on emerging markets for decades and seeing, obviously, the economic development there. But now seeing that in the you know, past you know, five, 10 years, you see things sort of shifting. And now the work isn't focused, basically, cheap labor isn't enough anymore for an advantage. And focusing more on this smart technology, smart, you know, smart manufacturing, and so forth. And so as I said, I think it's very similar to the creative class model. I mean, you're focusing on new technologies, 
You're focusing on skilled, talented labor force. And then the last part is focusing on an openness to collaboration, openness to sharing ideas, sharing innovation. And so in the areas where they researched, and so they traveled actually through the United States and through Northern Europe, looking at cities or regions that had kind of suffered from deindustrialization and seeing how these, a lot of these areas have reinvented themselves. And so I'm going to spend a few minutes about this. Now, I don't necessarily think that Wichita is a Rust Belt city. But some of the things are apl applicable to sort of what's going on here. So they give you an idea. So who are these areas, or what are these areas? So you have Akron, Ohio, which has now become a hub for polymers. And so I'll go through an example of that in a second. But also in Albany, New York, now is a hub for nanotechnology. Actually, Portland and Minneapolis, this is a little bit longer. They have sort of reinvented themselves. Portland was very much into the logging industry. Obviously, that's gone away, and now they've sort of reinvented themselves in bioscience. Same in Minneapolis, bioscience and medical devices. But if you look at these regions, what they saw, and obviously they went to a lot of different European cities too. They sort of reinvented themselves. They came up with these common experiences. So I thought this was very interesting to talk about. The first one was is that each of these areas had a life-threatening situation. And by this, it means a life-threatening situation to the economy of the city. But fortunately, at the same time, the city, these regions tended to have universities performing world-class research. And, it sort of, and this gets into their idea of sort of growing for the creative class. They're looking at these areas are trying to deal with you know, complex ideas that really require interdisciplinary, you know, approaches to solving these ideas, or solving these issues. And then there was an openness to sharing brain power. There was a connector. So somehow there's either a person or a series of persons that sort of could make the connections to help this happen. And then an infrastructure that attracts, obviously, and retains top talent. And access to venture capital. So basically, you need some money. But how do all these things interact? So I want to use the example of Akron, Ohio. So how many people have actually been to Akron? I've been there. I, I want to say, how many people have been there in the last five years? That's got a few. I have not. When I was in Akron, uh, it was probably in the late 90s. I don't know. But Akron has had a big transformation. But obviously, they've experienced all these things I've listed here. So Akron had what I would call a very life-threatening situation. So in Akron, basically the crisis is they were center of tire manufacturing. The four large U.S. tire manufacturers were all located in Akron. And for decades, the city did very well. And then sadly, basically in the early, mid-1980s, it all fell apart very quickly. And you went from producing all these tires, you know, millions, or millions and millions of tires a year, to producing almost none in a very short number of years. And so how's the city going to react to this? Then they had, so Akron does have a few things going for it. So they had the University of Akron, which, had, you know, obviously in the heyday of the tire manufacturing, had done a lot of research in, you know, materials research, a lot of it doing with, obviously, materials that go into making tires. And then Akron still had, you know, a deep skill set of material, you know, basically people who knew about materials and polymers. So a lot of imagine entire research was also going on there. And so obviously, as I said, this happens very quickly, that the industry sort of almost collapses. And so how does Akron respond? And so a big part of this is, well, you need sort of a connector. And so in this example, the connector actually was the president of the University of Akron. He was working, you know, obviously, this is in the 1990s, as president of the university, seeing that there's a need for the university now to, you know, to obviously part of the community, but also to help not just lead the economic development, but obviously the university can't in and of itself make economic development happen. But he really thought that the university could be at least an incubator for doing that. And so working with this, obviously they create a polymer center. Now is anyone in the room an expert in polymers? I'm not either. Yeah, you might. <laughs> You're going to know a lot more about polymers than I. Polymers are basically coatings, which at first sounds very, you know, so imagine like a wire and there's a coating over it. Well, that's a very, you know, low-tech example. The much, imagine 
What's being produced now in Akron are the latest, it's the cutting edge of polymer technology. And the city itself has done very well. But as you said, originally, but this is obviously still in the 90s, so they create this university polymer center. And sort of looking at, you know, can we take things that basically the professors at the university are working on and sort of exchange the, you know, the, oops, sorry, exchange the ideas with the industry to grow the area? And so you have this collaboration, or what they refer to as the sharing is brain power. And this is really the hardest part to happen, because it's not, okay, so some professor might come up with an idea, here's a new polymer, but if you don't really share that with the industry, and then the industry also sharing, obviously, their capabilities and their knowledge with what the academics are working on, this really isn't going to work. And so the hard thing is, is getting what they're saying, share the brain power is that this is really a two-way street. They're working on bringing all these players together, working for this sort of bigger cause. So obviously their idea was to basically work on improving polymers. Then once they were starting to do this, I mean, this is one of these things that sort of grows over time. Then they're able to convince other companies that were not in the Akron area at the time to move their research to Akron because, of course, all these different things are going on. They also luck out. The state of Ohio had a fund called the Third Frontier. Don't know where they came up with the name, but so the city, it, the, from the state, this is at the state level. So the state was using like this in the early 2000s to push money into high tech jobs in Ohio. And so it was a big help to kind of the right moment. This is one of these things, a lot of it's also timing, that things happen at the right moment. And so what happened for them is that this money sort of showed up at the right moment to really build on the momentum. And so now Akron is a world leader in polymers. They've also moved into other new materials. They're also moving into bioscience. So the city, the region has really grown over the last 20 years out of basically the ashes. So they give you an idea. So what are the implications for Wichita? Because obviously it makes some sense. And you can probably see there are some things. I mean, Akron, obviously, their ex experience is a little more you know, dire than it is in Wichita. Obviously, there you really had industry go from, you know, 100 to zero in a few years. Fortunately, in Wichita, that's not the case. But there are, we can draw some general conclusions from it. So implications for Wichita. One of the things, obviously, that I see as a big help for the future growth of Wichita, obviously, is the WSU Innovation Campus. It's the same idea, sort of like the original Polymer Center at the University of Akron. It's the idea of being an incubator for new ideas, obviously working with not only academic research, but working with the different industry in the area to come up with new, not just to come up with new ideas, but then how can we commercialize these ideas? And so a lot of this to be successful in Wichita is going to be building on these connections then. You know, can, build a, can we get this research to move together, to share the brain power? Another thing I think this is important for, kind of broader going back to the skill set of Wichita, is keeping WSU graduates in Wichita. Actually, this is sort of an extreme example, but imagine a college of engineering at the undergraduate level about one, just over, well, I guess 22% of undergraduates are international students. But at the graduate level, so these are people getting a master's degree or a PhD in engineering, about three fourths of them are international students. And so one way, this would be a great way to keep obviously highly skilled people in our area. Now, obviously we don't have complete control over that, obviously, you know, the city does not control what immigration policies are and so forth. But if you think about a resource for Wichita, this is an untapped resource, not completely untapped, but this is an area where they really help the city of Wichita to grow. Then, of course, building on our low cost of living, the different amenities in the area, of the artistic community, being open to new ideas. Fortunately, you know, Wichita does have a history of being an entrepreneurial city. So being, and part of that is being open to new ideas, you know. What's a, you know, in the early 1950s, what's a pizza? Who knows what that is? <laughs> Why would people care? Why, if I, what's a franchise? But then new ideas take off. And then really, as I said, the bottom line to all of this is being able to build on all these different parts and build it into a bigger ecosystem to sort of bring these things together. And that's what really will lead to greater economic growth. But, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Awipawi Sitongrung, and my student and my colleague and 
uh, of us here are welcome to call me Sai, which is my nickname. Um, I am an associate professor from uh, the School of Public Affairs and um, Administration at the Wichita State University teaching public budgeting and state local economic development. I am here today uh, to share with you for uh, my study result that I am kind of excited that, um, you know, uh, on the topic of um, the causality or the causal linkage between um, the creative class and uh, local economic growth. Well, um, um, this is the outline of the presentation. I am going to focus on uh, my study is very really focusing, so I'm going to uh, be specific about the background, the, the um, literature, theoretical framework, um, data and empirical approach, and empirical results and implication and conclusion. So um, first of all, let me argue this. Um, if, if you get the job offer, the same exact job content between the two towns, the same exact payment, you know, between the two towns, but one town had local cultural richness, art, symphony, uh, theater. Um, which place that you would choose to accept the job? So that is my uh, motivation of my study is that, you know, I really want to, um, I apologize, this is the study background. So basically, I really want to understand um, you know, um, part of the job is to ask how and why. You know, being a professor, you know, we, we need to understand how and why. When, when Richard Florida, as Dr. Uh, Kraft presenting it, that, hey, you know, creative class is going to enhance uh, local economic growth, well, the big question for me is like, how and why, to what way? And so the motivation of the study is that I really want to get the, um, you know, understand one, uh, some direction, strategic direction in terms of promoting local growth. And then, you know, um, I kind of care about efficiency and effectiveness. So in order to, for public or government to invest in something, then we need to find the efficient way to enhance, you know, the local economic, economic growth. So it's kind of bang for the buck. Um, and so the purpose of this study is to, um, examine whether or not there is the linkage between um, you know, the production, uh, the, the art production and local economy. I have to put this uh, notification that you know, other industrial sectors are important too. The reason that I focus on art sector is because it is the one big idea in crea creative class. And, and so I need to understand the big uh, sector in there. So the issue is that, you know, Richard Florida, like Tim presented that, you know, he make a big um, claim that, you know, creative class is going to contribute to local economic growth in the 2000s, so in the new century. And um, the problem is that, you know, his definition about creative class is really too broad. And so when it's too broad, like, you know, we, we, we learned it from previous presentation is that, you know, we have super creative core, we have scientists, we have, you know, engineering, we have uh, information technology, and then we have the, you know, designer, you know, dancer, artist, and um, actually, you know, those, I, I really think that it's too broad. And then we need to sort through, so that's my job to sort through what do what, who do what. And then, so the theoretical assumption is that, you know, the art sector is going to have dual roles in local economic growth to direct and indirect part. So these are the literature that you can see. Um, when the Richard Florida, you know, come up with the big idea, he uh, defined that, well, you know, creative class group is going to add the, uh, to the local economy because of the T3s that we learned from the previous presentation. Um, talent, uh, tolerance, and technology. I would like to highlight that, um, you know, as um, we see in the next bullet point that, you know, if this is not the new idea. In the previous time, you know, previous literature, especially in 1980, we have what is called um, human capital and third wave economy. And that means, you know, we focus on the quality of the, um, you know, uh, workforce, the skilled workforce. 
right? And the third web economy is talking about, you know, information technology programming using, you know, those kind of computer to generate uh, analytical job that you can take only one or two seconds compared to using human to do it. So in fact, you know, creative class uh, is actually, you know, enhanced, um, not enhanced, embraced, you know, the uh, human capital and third wave economy. The only thing that I see that is kind of relatively new in creative class is about um, the uh, tolerance, and that is at the individual level, as Tim pointed out, and the diversity of the you know um, individual and worker, and you know those kind of diversification is actually the things that add to the uh, local you know cultural richness. And so, in order to um, so so, I look at the. Um, the, the two more group of the literature, the third group of the literature said that, well, you know, the art sector is actually, um, the, 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 um, the third group of the literature said that, well, you know, the artistic. When, when we think about, when we hear creative class, we think about artists first. And then, you know, as we learn that we have engineering, we have professor, we have scientists, and um, you know those kind of business, you know, administrator and things like that. Um, so I, I like to sort out to separate between the two groups. And in fact, you know, that is the the second group we call knowledge based occupation. And knowledge based occupation is basically are those who get formally trained by, uh, by you know in educational institution. I need to say this, that why knowledge class occupation is important to me, to local economic growth, the problem is, uh, uh, the, the issue is that it is a high pay job. So we don't count only number of job, we count the quality of job. Well, okay, we have to exclude professor job, it's not high pay. <laughs> so um, so, um, so the, 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 the fourth group of the literature is that, um, so I kind of look at the, they found that basically, um, you know, art sector, you know, art production, local, you know, cultural richness is actually enhanced, you know, the um, stop, have played a role in terms of stabilizing the workforce. And then uh, the last group of the literature found that, you know, the art production is actually act as a basic sector. And basic sec sector means that, you know, if you have enough specialization in town, those kind of specialization is going to produce, you know, export goods and service. Hence, it's an expand the economic base, expand the job, expand the specialization and conglomeration. So it's not only art. Every sector can be the basic sector if it's big enough and accumulate enough of skilled workforce and uh, technological know-how. So um, then the theoretical framework is this. Um, business, um, the creative industry, what is the definition? Well, we need to define the, the, the meaning of it when we are going to talk about creative industry. So the American for the Arts uh, define the creative industry, industry as business involving the production and distribution of art. Simple as that. And then what, do, what does it mean by art production that I'm going to investigate in a few minutes? The art production uh, or art production index is wage earning and capital accumulation um, in the, uh, for the employment and business in, uh, creative, uh, in creative business. So the knowledge class worker are those who are, the knowledge based class worker are those who use individual skill, those who are trained by um, local, uh, no, I'm sorry, those who are trained by, uh, formally trained by uh, education institution like university, uh, high paid job, high, high, highly educated. So those are the example, the um, scientist, engineer, and the uh, tech, uh, information technology. Okay, the framework, as you can see that, um, you know, this is the, Okay, the main idea is that on the left side, we have art production index, and that is how we measure the art productivity or the productivity in art sector. And then uh, it plays two roles in the local e uh, economy. The first role, as you can see, is the green 
um, uh, arrow, that is the direct part, which is normal. You know, other sector can play that role too as a basic industry. Once we accumulate enough specialization, it is going to enhance local uh, personal income, and that is the measurement of standard of living. So it's not only productivity, but it's standard of living. And then the second role is indirect part. The art production is going to act as the, uh, you know, the enhancing the quality of life in the local area. And so when it's enhanced quality of life, it's going to attract the knowledge class worker, those high pay, high quality job. And then those kind of knowledge class worker and employer is going to contribute to, um, you know, local economy and hence enhancing standard of living. So the real idea here is that, you know, um, the, um, the, 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 the art sector or creative class is going to enhance quality of life. And quality of life is the key to attract the high paid job and the high paid worker and the high paid employer. Okay, so this is the data. Um, other, other variable, as we can see, we have private stock, public stock, and uh, total employment. Those are kind of other traditional growth factor that, um, you know, it had to be in the framework when we need to understand the role of art production. So the data, uh, we don't have, you know, the creative production index or art production index as uh, the data in the, as a publicly available data. So uh, we have to create index, as you can see on your table. Um, the data in, in my analysis includes uh, the art production in the, um, in 260 uh, metropolitan statistical area uh, during the time between 2001 to 2012. And um, the art production index is built based on five variables, as you can see the number of jobs uh, in art sector. And as you can see, the mean is about 41,746. The um, total wage in art industry, the mean is about 1.7 trillion. And then uh, the total after tax earning for the art industry is 483 million. And then um, the uh, total new establishment, the average for the sample is about 4,300 jobs approximately, and the average weight is about 16,598. Uh, bear in mind that this is the real dollar value in 2009. So it's not uh, dollar value today. Um, but this is the, uh, the, the, the snapshot of the data that I used to build art production index. So um, in, the, in your handout, you can see the rank of the art production uh, from the first you know, uh, city to the last city. Um, the first city, I think, is New York. And as you can see that the index is ranging from 11.18 um, um, to um, the lowest one, the uh, 260 rank is um, Cumberland, and that is minus 0.54. So any positive number of the index show that the city is uh, the, the level of our specialization and accumulation is above the mean. And then any index that is uh, 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 minus, it show that it suggests that those city had the level of art, you know, skill accumula accumulation and specialization below the mean. And so who are the mean in our study in the handout? And the mean in our study is, is Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, the, that the index is about zero, and then Boise, Idaho. And I think, you know, we can think about, you know, that is the abstract when we use number, but if you think about, okay, what kind of level of art and local cultural richness in Knoxville, Tennessee, that is the mean across 260 uh, city that we can see. I think Des Moines, Iowa is about uh, a little bit above uh, average, and that could be our benchmark that we can compare and contrast with, okay? Um, so um, the empirical result, as we can see that, um, okay, I. I did not, I was not told to not present the equation, but apparently I did something behind you guys back. So I did some kind of equation, and then uh, this is the empirical result. The results suggest that 
um, art production index is actually at to local economy and it's had dual role. The first role is, is uh, the art sector act as the um, um, you know the um, the basic sector. Of course, when we have enough specialization, it's not only art, manufacturing, trade, you know, wholesale. Those can be basic sector exporting goods and service, and hence, you know, we enhance the new economy because we have new face in town. And um, but so in that kind of direct path, we can see that for every one unit increase in art production index. That means the more we are specialization for one unit, we can uh, see the uh, local personal income enhanced for 1.8 percent, uh, all else equal. But the highlight here is the indirect part, the role of art production uh, in terms of enhancing the local culture, quality of life, and things like that. We found that uh, the 1 percent of art index, uh, art production, you know, increase. We're going to see. Um, Local personal income increasing for about 1.5% uh, approximately. The 3% uh, percent is multiplied by 0.5% is 1.5. That is the in, uh, indirect part. And how does that occur? That occurs through the knowledge class, high paid, high quality job at professional worker. So that is the, uh, the mediator role. So uh, this is what we find. And if you see that, uh, we can see that other uh, traditional growth factor like capital investment, public private capital investment, you know, employee, those are still important to local economy. But, um, you know, the size or the magnitude of the effect is kind of smaller relative to art production. I have to highlight that, um, you know, it's not only the, art, the, the one sector, but because the research focus on art, that's why I talk about this. Um, okay, so the implication, what does it mean for the uh, result? What does it mean is that uh, when we look at the uh, handout, we can see that Wichita metropolitan area rank 109, and actually the art production index or the specialization of Wichita is kind of, you know, uh, smaller than mean, that is minus 0.12. And because of that, um, you know, what does it mean to us? You know, because um, the research, as people say that, you know, uh, we, are, we are academic, you know, we say things that might not translate well into the practice, so this is the practice. So for Wichita, as you can see that um, the art index, the art production uh, is about uh, minus 0.12, so our uh, specialization is below the average, and then, um, on the average, uh, our personal income is about the mean personal income across you know um, 12 years is about 28 million. We have no less class uh, employment for about 280,000. That means you know the high paid, high quality, super creative core. This is the basic data. We have uh, 26,000 approximately for number of art job. So what does that mean? If we are to enhance, you know, our art specialization to that of equal to Des Moines, Iowa, and Des Moines rank number 54 in your handout, and um, the uh, index is about 0.09. So, of course, number doesn't, doesn't mean anything, but if we kind of contemplate for the level of art production and specialization in Des Moines, then we can see that if we have those kind of, you know, activity equivalent to that, we will see direct income in hand for about $110 uh, million. And this is constant uh, dollar value, the value in 2009. And uh, we will see the uh, indirect effect through the personal income that enhancing for $211 uh, million uh, 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 across uh, by the, through adding 841 no less class job or the high quality paid job or professional job. So if we are to enhance the level of art productivity to be equivalent to those of Portland, Oregon, that rank number 20, and um, the, um, so we will see that the direct effect is we're gonna see personal income for the city of Wichita enhancing for 451 million, that direct effect. And indirect effect, we're gonna see the income increase for 900 million approximately through 7,500 uh, high paid professional jobs that we add because they are attracted into town. 
Uh, so the conclusion is that art and cultural sector, you know, serve two roles or dual roles for the lo local economy. The first role is adding, you know, export um, uh, basic economy. So it's uh, export, uh, it's sending, it's creating, exporting goods and service. And then the second role is, you know, enhancing uh, quality of life and in order to attract high paid knowledge class worker and um, you know to get more uh, con business conglomeration. So um, supporting art industry to accumulate um, specialization in art, produce efficient and effective way to spend dollar. And I'm not saying that it's the most or the only one way, but it's the way that you know we might be able to bang for the buck because it had two roles. And, and when we spend at one time. And I know that, you know, in, in the literature we talk about, Richard, Richard uh, Florida talk about, you know, not only human, but, you know, pay, have the graphic, um, you know, painting and things like that. So it's more like paying on in, in terms of infrastructure and have artistic, you know, um, in the bus station and things like that. But I am more attracted to human capital and quality of the workforce. But those are combined because it enhanced the atmosphere. And then uh, the traditional growth factor, uh, you know, capital, labor, and uh, those are things that we can ignore too. It's still important as much as, you know, the um, creativity and diversity and, um, you know, cultural richness. But uh, nowadays, as I, I teach local state, local economic development, I would like to hand, um, I kind of, um, emphasize with the student that, you know, the quality of life is probably a big thing in terms of attracting uh, people into town because the the basic, you know, the old, as the basic and old, you know, theory about, you know, economic growth said that, you know, the more number of population, the better economy. And that means, you know, we can accept population decline. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you uh, both. As you guys get situated, let me let me do a little bit of a, a summary of the two presentations, and and uh, but be thinking of your questions as well as you might want to ask how this relates. Uh, so the you know the first one we talked about he, he laid the the framework of these three T's right. We had talent, and technology, and tolerance, and and in there. Um, when you talk about that talent, it was more kind of what was the skills and supply that we have within this area. And I think we can kind of come back to that a little bit. One of the suggestions I think I heard from, or on the final slide was, we also have supply of labor from the university. If we can retain some more of that supply of skilled labor from this university, that could help uh, grow some of that. The second one was technology. And I think uh, Tim was bringing the idea that there's, we develop with this innovation campus the university and that transfer of knowledge and speed that up to the industry, then we help improve that technology side of this. Uh, and then the third one, which I'll actually switch over to Sai, and it's more of the tolerance, but it's also the, what are the amenities and value within the community there? And uh, one thing I think I'd kind of highlight as she was talking about, we have these direct jobs. These are the artists and the cultural people with here. That is those direct jobs that she's talking about. And the indirect is because they're here, we can then attract or keep more students within the labor market. I think you can kind of see that relationship of how that might fit in the overall bigger picture, bigger, bigger picture to that. So now let me let me think about this. We have this idea: do jobs really are, are jobs the ones that create the people themselves, or is it the company that creates the growth, or is it really? Although those are the two ways we think about this. Are they really mutually exclusive? Do they really have to happen in two separate worlds? Or, and Tim, or really are they kind of more interlinked than, than that? And when we really come down to, not from the theoretical framework, but to how our economy works, how, how interrelated do you think they are in, in this context of skilled labor and, and creative class? Actually, I think they're very related. If you think about it, as I said, I gave the analogy of the chicken and an egg, but in this, you can think about the different types of industries, and there are going to be some that are more capital intensive. So I think more, think of the aviation industry. Obviously, I need lots of capital, so I need physical space in Wichita. 
and obviously that attracts workers. But then you also need, it's the idea of coming up with these new ideas in a more, like imagine like in a software company where more of the value is coming from the human capital, that those are people who are more mobile and therefore they are attracted by different amenities in the area. And so therefore there could be companies that are searching for where these people are going. But it's really, they're very, they are, it's always kind of like a revolving circle because then if more skilled labor is in an area and you see all these new things going on, that's gonna attract more firms. But on the other hand, and then obviously new firms from the area could attract new people. I think it, obviously both things are always going on. And that the difference comes from somewhat on the different industries that the firms are in and what their needs are for you know, how capital intensive they are versus the skill levels they need. So I think going forward, somebody mentioned like with the rust belts, the brain belts, that a lot of manufacturing is changing. It's not the same as it was 50 years ago. And it's changing to be you know, smart technology, smart production, and obviously the skill level of all workers is increasing. Or the, need, or the skill level of all the workers, the levels that are needed are increasing. Uh, so one thing that the center's done, and, and Mike is here from my office, he looked at the skills and knowledge categories within this Wichita area and within other areas in the state. And one of those things that he, he looked at is, he said, what are the skills and knowledge of engineers? And we have quite a few engineers. They're pretty highly ranked skills and knowledge categories. But we also, when you go down to the production side, which is not really classified on, on this, this, they're actually high skilled. And, and although we're doing that, these are complements to the overall economy that we have here. And I think it's important to say, although they're production workers are not directly in that creative class, but they are very skilled and they're interconnected at the same time. And so I think that's kind of what I wanted to pull away from. It's not just that we needed these knowledge workers here and then all the companies will come flowing into it. And it's not that we have the companies and that all these knowledge workers are gonna come here because, or not come here because we're not creative. You know, there's a little bit more interconnected of how they, the feedback loops of these regional economies. And so then the question, it feels almost pointless and like we, where are we gonna ever, where do we start or where do we influence this? And so, uh, so I, I kind of maybe, let's think about this since you teach you know, economic development on here. There's multiple ways to think of economic development. Can you give me a little framework how we, this is one kind of thought process on workforce, but we have you know, development, um, development from above where we're influencing it, development from below, pull and pour. Yeah. Maybe you can comment a little bit about from just what you do teach uh, students that are, we have MPA students, by the way, here in, in the audience, some of the things that you would teach them. So um, we have the something like, a, you know, we call supply side and, and demand side, um, local economic development. And um, in terms of supply side, what, what, what we do is, you know, we focus in terms of like, you know, helping the uh, business to reduce their production cost, right? So if that could mean like, uh, you know, producing the, you know, amenity public transportation, uh, road, you know, things like that, that can reduce the produ uh, business production cost. And then, you know, because what is the motivation for business is to reduce production cost, right? So they're gonna come into town. If we can promote, you know, um, if we can have like a, what is called like a, a skilled labor, and that is going to help the uh, business to uh, be more uh, productive. So that is supply side economic development, public infrastructure, you know, build, um, you know, all of those amenity. But then we have a uh, demand side economic development and that is kind of like looking at the business incubator, you know, in terms of like, you know, helping the small, um, uh, what is called the small um, employer, you know, the small scale you know, um, in terms of business establishment, retain and recruit, those are kind of, you know, the other side. And then, you know, in terms of demand side, we, we more focus on diversify and diversity, helping minority women, because those are the, uh, the resource that we can tap to make them be uh, the productive uh, factor in the local economy. And then another way, Jeremy, that we talk about, and it's a big thing, is to do cluster analysis. And cluster analysis means that, you know, it's kind of like, you know, it's not only one industrial se sector that is going to enhance the local economy. You need, so as we talk to, uh, I talked to one of the, um, you know, audience here, 
and um, you know you need so, so for example like software you know design and marketing you know you need the skill that is kind of intersect like you know programming you know computer skill and also you are the designer the web web developer those are kind of cluster development that you need multiple you know industrial sector that can enhance each other to move together the key is to do the analysis that where we are and what are the sector that we need in order to support us strategically to move forward right so uh, you know, how does that relate to and even the, the businesses here? When you're talking about clusters, there's a group of organizations or, or businesses that feed into each other's loops. And so, you know, as that cluster builds, sometimes they keep building more demand for other companies. The one thing that's good to put in context, you know, we have a cluster as aerospace, but this cluster is very mature and it has gone very global, so it looks very different. Now, this is actually more of an opportunity really for our region because we can say, okay, how do we redefine this cluster around other technologies? And that's really the question where, how do we embrace this knowledge category, knowledge class, and fitting into these new clusters that are emerging from it? And, and one, of the, one of the analysis in, in my uh, student in my class last semester, they did the analysis uh, particularly about Wichita area. And as you talk about the, you know, aerospace is kind of mature and, and then we have more opportunity in terms of art, entertainment and service sector and also healthcare um, and uh, sector. So that is uh, the looming uh, sector that we need to, we, we get it from the data. Yeah, so, so, so great. Um, there's those interconnections, how are to fit. Now we're gonna stay mostly on this creative class, but. Uh, thank you for doing that because it's really, when you talk about economic development, it comes from multiple different ways and this cluster is also an organic thing of our, our regional economy, how it works together. So uh, I'm going to go to the audience and what I want you to do is when you stand up, uh, go ahead and, and say your question. I'm going to repeat this so we have it, uh, so we can know everyone can hear and we also have it on the recording. So yes, yeah, go ahead and stand up and, and state your question and maybe, and also uh, who you work for so we can have a context of, of what the question might be from if it's related. So this is uh, Robert, he's a lawyer, and he's talking about, the question is, we have artists, but what are artists needing and looking for? So, Sayo, can you go ahead and, and maybe respond to that question? Um, this is a good question, because when I start to do the, uh, the, the literature review myself, I, I kind of ask that question. And what is kind of particular characteristic of them that, you know, um, um, why they would come? So uh, in one of the literature that I studied, they talk about um, you know, the artist group in Montana. And those people are, you know, they're correct, they, they are different than other knowledge class. And so in the literature, they say that they would be attracted into Tao because they see people who are like them. So the previous you know, art, uh, you know, the level of art test people and also like for example in, in Montana they have a lot of the university had a big role in terms of you know having professor and department that generate the artwork and one of the um, conversation the interviewing in that literature is that you know the artistic the artists are influenced by um, you know the for example the beautiful scenic that kind of make them become more creative in terms of uh, producing their work. I was, I was having the same reaction, laughing, but actually, you know, and they love to, you know, uh, stay in the same place where they are their colleague. So for example, when I was in Omaha, Nebraska, the level of artists is increasing because they have art gallery that they throw, the city can play the role in terms of, you know, um, throw the, you know, the, the, festi the fair and festival, and then they ca it's just like, you know, we go to our academic conference, or you go to, you know, lawyer conference, that you see the same people in the same occupation, and then they exchange the idea. So basically, you know, the small group of the art, this is going to attract the more, the, the larger group, and so it's, it's, it's about, you know, the skill and specialization that is kind of unique. So in order to attract them, the literature didn't say, but to me, I would think that, you know, as a, you know, the university, the public, you know, sector, the community, we have to, we have to make the atmosphere that kind of conducive for their, 
creative work. So yeah, I hear you. So part of this is public infrastructure, but part of it you said there was a festival, if I heard in this. Yeah, so part of this was also organic that moved behind it. Activity art gallery, you know, art, what is called the, the, the gallery hotspot, like in Omaha, that, you know, every three months there will be artists come and then, you know, they, they kind of show their picture and that, that you know, that, that creative work. And then they kind of have round table and things like that. So l let me follow up on this on, on one segment. We have Carg glass and the other glass blowers because of Carg. It seems like that's kind of one of the niches of, of unique art that's already somewhat organic from this region. But how does that fit in with this within our, this cluster of, of art? I mean, how is there more value to that? Is there a cluster that could be, you know, that could be emerged more from the glass side, or just thoughts of that one particular subsect or, of um, art? So, for example, um, you know the um, the um, for example, if you have like a dancer, so they they are going to be attracted into the place. So for example, like, you know, the place like, well, if you think about New York, they have people who like value, you know, the uh, going to theater and value the dance, you know, ballet and things like that. And of course they have more fundraiser and, you know, donation and things like that. But they are going to be so your question, can you, can, what is it? I was thinking a car glass was a, seems to be somewhat organic here. What, what's the value of that one segment and can it, can it, can that be a unique way of growing our art and culture class here? Um, it's, it cannot stand alone, but it's need to like, you know, merge with, so for example, like dancer, you know, it will be merged with entertainment and, you know, other, like university usually, you know, be a, a big role player in terms of, you know, education and, and, and entertainment and, and cultural creator, something like that. So I hear it's much more interconnected is, is what kind of what yep. you're saying. Yep. Another que question from the audience? Yes, go ahead and stand up back there, yeah. So the question is uh, from GMLV talking about telecommuting and some of the changes in technology. We can broaden that a little bit in attracting and retaining this creative class. And, and the, well, Tim, can, can you yeah. respond to that? Yeah. It's interesting. Can you think about it? Because then you could live anywhere in the world. You could be on your mountaintop and just... <laughs> I don't know why people are so attracted to the mountains, but it's, you could live in the prairies and you wouldn't have to, <laughs> you wouldn't have to worry about living in L.A. I don't know. It's, I think what it... It's interesting because some research is a little bit different than what we talked about earlier, but some research has shown is that one of the downsides of telecommuting is that you don't, is the, the level of interaction you have with other people. The upside is, is that I could, you know, I could live anywhere and it gives me, you know, there could be benefits to me personally, but then there are also costs to you and the idea that you're lose, you still, even though technology has made it so much easier, you can Skype with people and you can do their FaceTime and so forth, but it's still not quite the same as actual face-to-face -face interaction. But it's interesting, so it's especially working for an architecture firm, my guess is that you could have people working for you. If they're working on designs, you could send it to them. They could work on the designs and send it back to you. But then they sort of miss out on not just working. Imagine someone who's just a, um, I, I'm gonna call, say, an architect doing the design, you know, of the actual structure. But obviously I know at the firm, you have people who are also in design, like thinking of the interior design of the space and so forth, that they're not really working with those people face to face, and you wonder if they lose some then in their designs. I know, as I said, I think I see it more as a trade-off. So, so Tim, in your presentation, you were talking about we're moving to the smart culture being the key factor, and then you said, okay, hey, we have this Rust Belt to Brain Belt, and so I pulled up some data and said, what's Kansas ranking? Uh, 50 states. How much do we have, what's, what's our ranking on the percent it having a bachelor's degree? And now normally, because we're a smaller state and various things, we usually tend to go 25 or 30 on rankings. And the percent in a bachelor's degree in Kansas is 15. We're not percent, the ranking is 15. We're pretty high. So, so to this comment, does the Rust Belt have an asset? Absolutely, we have a lot of highly educated, very valued, skilled workers. So, is it possible going to this telecommunication? Is possible to say I like quality of life or family or culture if we're 
if we're enforcing that through the communities and lifestyles and wanting to stay local and then do that work anywhere else. I, I will say, on, just because I always want to give all the sides, let's think about it holistically, what is that pipeline? However you look at the ranking of students now going and getting a degree for freshmen, our ranking drops down to 31. So our future pipeline of educated workers is not looking as great as our current infrastructure. And where is that current infrastructure around? In Kansas, in Wichita? This is over in the baby boomers. This is the older educated workforce. So we're now kind of on the edge, and if we don't embrace it, this resource, we're going to lose it. We will not be that resource because those are that resource is migrating to other areas, uh, and, and so we're losing some of that education. So telecommunication may not work. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, from the Gretemann Group talking about we're working a lot with artists and asking about public art, that the, we had this history of public art, and then where can that happen again to create some of this, this value? And, and so I, maybe you want to respond directly to that? Um, I would say that, you know, um, it would be more like other, you know, um, other, it's not only art, you know, group, but other groups. So um, one of the things that we have in public administration is, you know, to do, um, to have like a, you know, community awareness. And so in that case, you know, we need to get more like, you know, the group that kind of value and then, then we send the, uh, we, we have the dialogue and then we, set, we communicate. So I, I would think that, you know, the, the way to do that is, you know, through, you know, the network the local network that, you know, kind of make it larger and larger as the time go by. The second thing is, you know, uh, we have the uh, Chamber of Commerce that I think, uh, you know, in the business side that I think, you know, they can help you kind of promote and enhance, you know, the good and service to, um, you know, export it to outside. So, um, because uh, the cham that is the, all the, um, you know, the business, uh, local business, local um, economic develop, uh, local economic development organization that they can help you in terms of marketing and, you know, uh, advertise and find the, uh, the channel that you can release the goods and service. Because I think that that is going to be the reverberation when it's become like, you know, uh, well known, then, you know, the attention will come. So um, the city has a group of people that do, uh, the chamber has a group of people that do city to city. And one of the visits they went on was Chattanooga, but there were some other examples where there was public art that was on purpose and how they, they influenced it. And it didn't actually have to come from all public dollars. It actually was just an influence. And as I recall, Chattanooga, and I have, quote, don't, you know, go check this out because I'm not, it's been a few years since we did that one. They created a street that no one wanted. It was, I think it was kind of somewhat abandoned. And the city kind of repurposed it and then got a few artists to come in there. And as they started reviving that area, because this was uh, uh area that was de very depleted and was not looking good, the artists re uh, created value for that, so much value that that property value started coming up. They put art on the street. And then people started moving in and buying it and brought property values. Then they started moving down the street to cheaper areas because artists didn't have the money. So. Uh, I haven't seen that as a direct strategy where, where we have someone that is in thinking that on that level of, of a strategy for economic development, bringing some of those art communities together, not, maybe, not necessarily having to be all public cash to do it, but trying to take those areas and, and infuse some of that. Some of that we're seeing through downtown development, and um, I think they're thinking about properties and connections and then public spaces, 
but there probably could be a little bit more as a strategy for our community where we say, okay, hey, here's an area that is not looking good in downtown. Why can't we give this over to a group of our, an art community, really reinforce that as a, as a growth. So I think that's a good idea, um, something the community probably could think about to help embrace the art community a little further. Do we have another, one more question, and then we can, uh, yes? All right, so Susie's asking, what are some tangible things we could do to bring our art index up? And by the way, just in context, her proposal was not going from you know, the very bottom of the bucket to the very top. I think she was just trying to move up to a, a more reasonable community. I think it was Des Moines, right? Uh, Des Moines was, you shouldn't be that far out of our strategy for you know, the Midwest. And so I think it's a reasonable kind of mm -hmm. stretch goal. Um, I think we've already started hitting at some of those ideas, but do you have some more formal, I know you're thinking broader from an academic, you know, what is that relationship, but have you thought about more detailed what could be done in the community to bring our art index up, to well, influence it at least? First of all, the index was measured in terms of the, um, you know, the number of uh, art job establishment and the wage for the uh, art job, the income, and so I would, I would, my answer would be focused on, you know, uh, having the employer, the job employer, and have people who value the, the art, uh, goods and service, and enhancing the numbers of artists. Of course, in the literature, especially Richard Florida, you know, talk about a lot of enrollment and infrastructure. So, for example, he said, put the art, you know, um, the, 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 the picture, the art picture, you know, in the bus station to cre create, you know, those kind of en enrollment. Those are infrastructure investment. But to me, I think the first thing we need to do is to enhance more number of jobs. And that means, you know, it's like other uh, local economic development activity, you know, for the, like, for example, the small town in Kansas that I teach my, my student, you know, we have practitioner who come and they don't talk about art, but when they talk about enhancing more number of jobs, most of the time you become salesman and go attract, you know, and ask the business to relocate. And that we might have to start doing that from the scratch. Uh, another thing is, you know, to, 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 to link it with the previous question, Jeremy, um, the art could link it with tourist uh, industry too. So for example, if you have more museum, if you have more theater, those are the indirect way to attract, you know, the, uh, the art worker into town. Okay, so um, great comments. Uh, what we're going to do, let me give you a little bit of summary, then we'll go to a break for 10 minutes. We'll come back at 9.45, and then we're going to switch over and get to more of the practitioner side, discuss some of these things. Maybe the, some of these conversations will spill over in our dialogue, but we'll talk a little bit more on the, you know, the interactions with some of this creative class. Maybe art will come up more. Um, let me give you a bigger picture. We had those three T's. Let me come back to them. You know, when you talk about talent, we have talent. I mean, there are some unique talents that are within this region, but I don't think we should be so overly optimistic because I think we are missing some of the very really creative and really skilled, high, high skilled people that are just not staying or being uh, attracted to the region. And that's, that's an issue for our region. We should not just go away thinking everything's glossy. Uh, technology, although technology and patents, we talk about ourselves being entrepreneurial. I've looked at lots of data. We, you know, declining in some of those areas of, of what those innovations. Now, all innovations are not going to be patents anymore. There will be technology that are spilling over. And so we're not seeing a lot of that. And sometimes the atmosphere behind the, to encourage people to create patents are, are the if flow of income, the risk of almost failure of an industry are where you start seeing some of those demand for it. And we haven't really seen a turn yet, and we're not really quite there. The infrastructure is being built right now. We are not there yet to really turn that corner to be super innovative. But, but we could be getting there, you know, down the road, five, ten years down the road. And then tolerance, you know, the score, you know, coming down, uh, you know, below average is probably not necessarily where we want, would like to be. We don't, I don't think anyone wants to want to be below average. 
Uh, so when you're thinking about the art community, I think we need to figure out where are those assets. I mean, it's not just, I mentioned car glass, but I think that's a unique segment that we have here. But we also have quite a bit coming from the university for art. And there's some other, not just WSU, but the other universities for dance and so forth that, that are actually some really good cultural amenities that we have that we just haven't really quite embraced maybe or figured out how to develop. Uh, so not really high, but there are some that even from what I'm looking at that, that are some unique assets. You just haven't really pulled them together in, in a u unique way. So with that, we're going to pause for 10 minutes, come back here at 945, and then we'll start the second part. So thank